Hi, I'm Katya. And I'm Rin. And we're here at the Commonwealth Center for Holistic Herbalism in Boston, Massachusetts. And on the internet everywhere, thanks to the power of the podcast. Woohoo! And the YouTube, and the whole internet, basically, because, <laughs> uh, which is great, because that helps us to reach you and lots of people that we might not otherwise be able to talk to. And we're really hyped about that, especially given uh, this next series of podcast episodes that we've got planned. Oh my goodness, you guys, I'm so excited. I am so excited. So this is the first part in a series of strategies to safely improve some of the most common health concerns, that, especially ones that we see in under-resourced areas. So the purpose of this series is to create knowledge that will empower communities to start to take action to support their own health. In many cases, there simply isn't accessible medical care available. And in other cases, the medical care that is available is so understaffed and so stretched to the limit that it's difficult for people to get quality care. Even, even though there are people who want to provide it, they're just so overworked that they can't they can't see everyone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we want to provide some safe, accessible tools and some skills that will help to fill in the gap there. Um, so this is not medical advice, right? Because <laughs> uh, we're not doctors and we know, you know, we tell, tell you that every week and <laughs> we're going to do it again. Uh, but so it's not medical advice, but it is safe, accessible self-care strategies that can improve health outcomes. And we believe that all people have a right to accessible and high quality health care. Yes, whether it is t tools and skills to take care of your own health uh, so that you don't need conventional medicine, but also access to conventional medicine when that is necessary. We mm -hmm. think that everybody has a right to that. Yeah. So our plan with this series is to work with a relatively small number of easy to get and inexpensive herbs. So you're gonna notice the same herbs coming up again in different places. Um, and that's okay. You, as we go through, you might be thinking, oh wait, I know another herb who can really help with that. And there are, there are so many plants who can help with the different types of things that we're gonna be talking about. The ones that we've chosen are inexpensive, they're effective, and for the most part, they're widely accessible. Also, we've cho chosen herbs that are generally safe and generally don't have interactions with medications unless we've specifically made a note of um, an interaction that you need to be aware of. Yeah, and we'll we'll be making an effort in this series to make those notes every single time. Yes. <laughs> Just yes. so that it's really clear. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So you can get more information on this project as it unfolds uh, if you go over to commonwealthherbs.com slash mutual aid, mm -hmm. all one word, mutual aid. And uh, that'll get you there. Yes. Yeah. Also, a printable version of this work is going to be available at the end of the series, along with information about how to start a community health collective um, and all the different types of tools that you're going to need to do that. And we're making this work available for free to all people because we want everyone to have these skills. So if you'd like to support this work, you can do that also at commonwealthherbs.com slash mutual aid. And you'll also find a sort of table of contents of the different issues that we're going to be covering over the next um, um, a, two months, maybe a little bit longer. Yeah, for a mm -hmm. little while. <laughs> All right. So um, we'll get into today's topic in just a moment. But first, we want to give you our, our weekly reclaimer. Yes. Where we remind you that we are not doctors. We are herbalists and holistic health educators. The ideas discussed in this podcast do not constitute medical advice. No state or federal authority licenses herbalists in the United States, so these discussions are for educational purposes only. Everybody's body is different, so the things that we're talking about may or may not apply directly to you, but we hope that they'll give you some good information and some stuff to research further. Yeah, and we want to remind you that good health is your own personal responsibility. and. What we mean by that primarily is that the final decision when considering any course of therapy, whether it's discussed on the internet or prescribed by a physician, is always yours. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, today's topic is cardiovascular health, um, and we're going to cover two of the most common and also most work withable um, issues in cardiovascular health, and that's high blood pressure and high cholesterol. 
Uh, there's a lot of safe ways to work with these. And if we start working on them in that early phase, mm. then we can head off bigger problems that might be coming down the line. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That was really key, actually. <laughs> <laughs> that uh, the best time to start taking herbs is before you have a serious problem. Mm -hmm. You know, um, if you know that there's a health risk in your family or in your community, uh, if you know that you've had issues with a, a part of your health in the past, that's something to take care of in a proactive way. Yes. You know, um, and again, one of the things about this about this series in particular, but really the way that that Katya and I work with herbs generally, uh, is that we choose herbs that are quite safe in in every context possible. Mm -hmm. uh, herbs that you can take even if you don't have a health problem right now, but that can strengthen your body, that can help you to become more resilient. Um, and can sustain health in a lot of ways, not just as medicine, but as food and as uh, superfood and as <laughs> and as herbs. You know, we we, we think of them in uh, in their own right. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in a lot of ways. So, so you can introduce herbs into your life, and uh, you can protect your heart that way. Yes. So let's start with high blood pressure. Yeah. 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 So. so <laughs> no, it's my turn. Yeah. Yes. yeah. So high blood pressure is when the blood is putting too much pressure on the walls of the blood vessels, your veins, your arteries, all the tubes that the blood is flowing through mm -hmm. inside of your body. Mm -hmm. And um, you can imagine this kind of like a garden hose, right? If you cover up the end of the garden hose while it's got the water coming out, if you cover up the end with your thumb, then the water builds up pressure in the hose. And instead of flowing out normally, it will spray out with a lot of force, mm -hmm. right? So you can imagine blood uh, building up pressure in your own blood vessels in a similar kind of a way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's a couple, of, there's several ways actually that this can happen. There are different types of things that can cause this problem. Um, but two are sort of the most common and, and very universal. And if we can reduce these two things, then we will have a huge impact. And again, this is not medicine. We are not trying to cure the problem. We are trying to get tools in the hands of people to be able to improve the situation and to make significant progress in the situation. So if we just address these two main causes, it's gonna be stress and uh, salty foods. If we deal with these two things, then we can make a huge health impact. Hmm. Yeah. All right. So let's start with stress. Mm -hmm. When you have stress, you get tense. Yes. And you probably didn't mean, need me to tell you that. Right? <laughs> like you've had the experience of like having a stressful day and feeling the pain in the neck or the lower back or wherever you carry it, you know. Um, but this is also happening inside of the body, inside of your blood vessels. Mm -hmm. The blood vessels themselves can become tense. And when they tense up, they constrict. Um, think of like a band of muscle wrapped around the blood vessel mm -hmm. and that muscle it can either tighten up and constrict and make a smaller bore or it can relax and have a, have a wider tube for things to flow through. Mm -hmm. So when they constrict they get narrower and uh, it's associated with tension and this is why high blood pressure is often called hypertension. Right. right? Right. Uh, just like just like you feel that tension in your neck up here and you can say, wow, I have a lot of tension. This is the same. Those muscles around the arteries, they constrict and cause too much tension. So that is hypertension. And that hypertension makes your blood vessels narrower. It builds up more pressure because it's the same amount of blood in there. Mm -hmm. Right. It still has to move that same amount through. But now it just needs to to go with more pressure to get through, right? So you're trying to fit the same amount of blood into a smaller area, yeah. <laughs> right? Uh, like if you try to put on a pair of pants, that's just too small. Right, there's you're the same to... amount of you and you're trying to get into a smaller pair of pants. Yeah. There's, a, there's some pressure there. You're squeezing in, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So that can lead to problems. Um, so yeah, so it's, it is that direct connection and this is gonna apply with any kind of stress, right? It doesn't have to be, you know, one particular type of stressful uh, situation. Mm -hmm. So whether it's stress about money or it's stress about work or it's stress about family or it's stress about your health or, mm -hmm. or any of the many things that can cause stress for us, they all result in the same kind of effect. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So obviously a great solution would be to have no more stress, but <laughs> yeah. that is not, that's not something that is within our power, right? Like there are a lot of stressful things in this world and, um, we can't escape. Maybe you can escape some of them, but we can't escape all of them. 
Uh, but there are herbs who can help and there are some holistic strategies, some steps you can take in your life that can also help. So let's start off with the herbs who can help. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, first, let's talk about chamomile. Mm -hmm. So um, first thing to know about chamomile is that it's okay to take it in tea bags. Yes, yes. <laughs> no problem. Um, and uh, that let that stand in for all of the herbs that we talk about as we go along, you know, that uh, it doesn't have to be the most perfect, organic, you know, shade grown, whatever. Yes. Um, <laughs> uh, whatever's appropriate. That would be great. And where that's accessible, where that's available, where it's affordable, go for it. But if it's not, uh, don't write off the herbs that you do have access to just because they're less than perfect. Yes, you yeah. can absolutely go to the grocery store and buy a box of chamomile tea in tea bags, and it is still going to help you. So... Don't, don't turn your nose up at that. That is absolutely still medicine. Yeah. yeah. So chamomile tea, it can help to relax. It can help to relax your muscles. It can help to relax the feeling of stress in your body and in your mind. Mm -hmm. And that's going to have those direct impacts on the amount of tension in your whole system, including your blood vessels. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In order to get this effect, you can drink three to four cups a day of chamomile tea. Now, if you love chamomile tea, you can have more. That's totally fine. Um, but if you try to do at least three to four cups a day, that is going to really help throughout the whole day and over time to relax the muscles and the nerves in your body. Um, and it's fine if you want to drink it hot or if you want to drink it cold so you can brew it up and then mm -hmm. put it in the refrigerator or put some ice in it. That's also totally fine. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's okay to sweeten it a little bit if you want to. You can put a little honey in there. Mm -hmm. Some people like to put a little lemon into their chamomile tea. Oh, that's so nice. Yeah. Um, and uh, you can absolutely feel free to put other so-called flavoring herbs in there like peppermint or, or hibiscus. Uh, those plants secretly do have lots of medicinal benefits, mm -hmm. you know, and some of them we'll be mentioning later on in this episode. Um, but feel free to do those kinds of things as well to make your tea enjoyable, you know, because the only herbs that work for you are the ones that you actually take. Yes. Um, so, you know, don't struggle through with something and be like, ah, I got to take this because it's good for me. Um, now, chamomile is a pretty low bar for that. You know, it's a fairly tasty tea. It's a fairly familiar flavor. You know, lots of people have had this already in their mm -hmm. life. So the bar there is pretty low. But just as a general idea when you're working with herbs, um, make them enjoyable. Yeah. <laughs> you know, make yeah. them delightful. That counts a lot for medicine, too. Now, it's a really good idea if you're working with chamomile to help you manage stress to, to drink some chamomile tea every day, to be consistent with this. Don't just do it on the days that you feel stressed. Really do it every day because the reality is if you've got high blood pressure, your body is telling you that you have been under stress for a long time. And there is probably a, a fairly high level of stress that you just accept as normal in your life. Mm. And so we want to not just reduce the stress on a day that feels extra stressful for you, but we want to reduce that normal high level and, and bring that down as much as we can. If we can't re get rid of the things that make you feel stressed out, then at least we can provide something that will help to relax the muscles, relax the tension. So we do want to work with this every day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, let's talk about Tulsi next. Yes. This plant is also called holy basil, mm -hmm. same herb. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so with Tulsi, again, it's totally okay if it's in tea bags. There mm -hmm. are some uh, really good quality Tulsi tea bags out there that are pretty widely available. Yeah, you can get them at a lot of the grocery stores. Mm -hmm. um, so, and you can also get them online, but sure. a lot of grocery stores do have Tulsi or holy basil tea available. Yeah, yeah, it's becoming more popular. Mm -hmm. And uh, in this case, that's a very good thing. Yes. <laughs> Tulsi is a really fantastic herb. It helps with a lot of different things in, in the body, actually. It supports health in a number of ways. Uh, for this topic, you know, Tulsi particularly helps you to cope with stress and it reduces inflammation in the body. Um, and when it comes to the high blood pressure, the, the tension pattern is a, is a problem. The um, accompanying problem is an increased amount 
of inflammation inside of the body, mm -hmm. um, in large part due to that tension and the impairment of free flow of blood that results from it. Mm -hmm. So Tulsi is helping to, to put a check or to, to quiet down some excessive inflammation. And again, it also helps you to cope with stress more efficiently. Um, Tulsi is in a category of herbs we call adaptogens. And that means that they help your body adapt to changing circumstances, including stressful circumstances, much more easily. Mm -hmm. One of the great things about Tulsi is that it helps us to make a transition from a, a response to something stressful, like if something scary happens or there's a loud noise or, um, you know, you weren't looking and you almost stepped into the street, yeah. you know, whatever <laughs> that, that gives you that stressful moment. Uh, you need that kind of reaction to survive as a human in the world, right? But we don't want to be having that reaction to every email we get and every news story we see and all of those things through the day. So we need to be able to come back down to a place of calm and, and again, relaxation or, or, or calm, centeredness. Yeah. And Tulsi helps us to make that transition more easily, to go from a place of agitation and anxiety and alert to defend yourself to to recognize that the threat has passed, that I'm in a relatively safe space right now, that I can release that that tension mm. that is, you know, as a, as a self-protection mechanism. Yeah. Yeah. Now, if you are taking medication for diabetes, then it's important if you're going to work with Tulsi that you test your glucose levels daily because Tulsi can also improve diabetes enough that you might need to monitor and uh, make sure that your dose of your diabetes medication is still correct. And we're going to talk more about that when we talk about diabetes and pre-diabetes. Um, but for now, just to, just to mention that if you're going to work with Tulsi every day, it is important to just be on top of testing your blood glucose levels at least once a day just to make sure that you don't need to make an adjustment with your diabetes medication. Mm -hmm. If you do need to make that adjustment, then make sure that you make an appointment with your doctor right away so that he knows or she knows that you need to have that adjustment made. Yeah, what you, what you would be seeing would be that your blood sugar readings were getting too low. Or that they were improving, right? Maybe you were having them pretty high and they were starting to come down and you're saying, wow, this is, this is good. My number is starting to come down. If you see that and you see it consistently happening, that's when you want to just give your doctor a call and let them know that your numbers are changing and that you should be checked to make sure your dose for your medication is still correct. There you go. Uh, but if you're not taking diabetes medication, or even if you are, but you're going to test regularly, you can drink, again, three or four cups of Tulsi tea a day. And again, it is great to do this every day because we want to be working every day on bringing those tension levels down so that we can relax the tension in the, in the blood vessels, relax the tension on the heart, and bring that blood pressure level down. Mm -hmm. You know, also, you can switch back and forth. One day you could drink chamomile, the next day you could drink Tulsi. Or you could mix your chamomile and your Tulsi together. That is completely fine and also quite delicious. Now, you also do not have to make each cup individually. If you want, and especially it's really hot today, and so this appeals to me a lot today. <laughs> if you want, you can in the morning just boil up, or at, at some point in the day that's convenient for you, boil up a kettle of water and put three or four tea bags into a quart size mason jar. And then put the hot water on, let it brew. If you want to put it in the refrigerator afterwards, that's totally fine to make it cold. Um, but now you have your whole quart that you're going to drink for the day and you can just pour some whenever you want it or put it into a water bottle, take it with you for the day. Mm. But that way you don't have to make it every single time that you want to drink it. And especially because lives are busy. There's so much to do. There's kids to run after. There's work to be done. You got to go to your job. Uh, if you have all of it made at one time and now you can just take it with you wherever you go, then you know you're going to drink it through the day. You don't get to the end of the day and say, oh, I meant to have my tea today and I didn't do it. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
All right, so chamomile and tulsi are really helpful herbs for high blood pressure, but there are some other things that we can um, talk about that are also going to help here, um, aside from aside from the herbs. So the first one that I would highlight would be movement. And this doesn't have to mean going to a gym. This doesn't have mm. to mean lifting weights per se. Um, we're talking about movement in the most general sense here. Mm -hmm. So that, that would include exercise, but it would also include playing with the kids, taking the dog for a walk, doing chores in the house uh, or in the yard, mm -hmm. um, just walking if, if your commute involves a long walk. You know, like all of that counts as movement mm -hmm. time. So you want to take a little um, moment and kind of observe yourself through your day and, and think about how much time do I spend sitting in one place or standing in one posture, uh, leaning against the same counter, whatever it may right, be, right? Right, right, um, Because movement helps the body to release stress, to release tension. Think about if you wake up in the morning and you're feeling kind of stiff and, all right, you get, get moving, get that blood flowing a little bit. If you could go for a walk or if you could you know, do some do some yoga or some ground movement or whatever feels good to you, then you start to loosen up. You start to feel a little more freedom, you know? Maybe your joints stop cracking after a little while and feel like your blood is flowing a little better. Because it is, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Because it is. And so when we when we move the, f the whole body, that actually does help to reduce blood pressure quite substantially. Because when you uh, move more of your muscles, you draw blood into... Uh, into the into the the periphery of your body. If you take a walk, you bring the blood down into your legs and c circle it back up all the way through. Your arms are swinging; it's moving down into your hands and everything. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you go walking in the winter time, you can feel your body warm up after a while. You know, after the first mile or so, you're like, okay, I'm feeling a little warmer now. This is good because the blood is flowing out to more places in your body. But that means that it's not kind of collected or all stuck in, in the middle where it tends to settle in when we're being sedentary, when we're sitting down. Mm -hmm. So um, the, the movement here, it's both that kind of physical effect of helping the blood to flow, reducing pressure that way, um, improving distribution, uh, but also movement helps to relieve stress. You know, yes. uh, it can help to just relieve, you know, feelings of stress and anxiety and tension um, just to, to get out there and to move around a bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, You can just, uh, you know, if you don't move a lot right now and and you think, boy, exercising seems intimidating. If you just go for a walk, a 10 minute walk three times in the day, already that is going to make an improvement. Or choose something that you really enjoy, like maybe dancing and dance every day. If you have a job where you have to move your body a lot, uh, in that case, you may come home and be very sore at the end of the day. And you might think, I do not want to go for a walk. That's actually fine. Don't go for a walk. You just worked really hard all day. In that case, though, um, uh, some stretches might really help you. If there's a particular part in your body that you use a lot in your job, uh, like if you use your hands a lot to do some kind of grabbing movement, uh, for example, then stretch your hands open. Do the opposite kind of stretching. Uh, if you bend over a lot in your job, then try to stretch the backs of your legs when you get home um, or maybe twist back and forth uh, in your in your chair so that you look behind you in either direction. Um, any kind of stretching that's going to help you to relax the muscles that you worked hard all day. Because again, our whole point here is that we want to relax the tension. If your muscles are hurting and they're all tensed up, then that's the opposite of what we're trying to do. So. If you have a job where you have to sit still most of the day, then we want to go for a walk, go dancing, do something enjoyable. If you have a job where you have to move your body a lot and you're sore at the end of the day, then we want to do some stretching to try to relieve the tight muscles. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And in, in every case, we are trying to, to look for those periods of either sedentary time or repetitive motion time um, and try to break those up. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, you're, you, when you're at work, then the amount of breaks you get is not always up to you, right? Um, but uh, if, you get, if you do have breaks, take them, you know, move yeah. in, a, in a different way from whatever it was, you know? So if you had been sedentary while you're on the job, then when it's break time or when it's, when it's not work time, 
get up, take take walks, move around, stretch a little bit, even if you're you're you know just for five minutes mm-hmm. in between tasks or something like that. Um, if you're getting that kind of repetitive motion, then if you if you get a break or it's lunchtime or whatever, then trying like you said to to find the opposite kind of movement to mm-hmm. to bring it out in the other direction, that can be really helpful. Um, but just again, wherever possible, looking to break up periods of sedentary time or repetitive motion time to have it be different have it have it change Mm -hmm. and that helps a ton all right all right one other thing that you can do in your life to help deal with stress is to sleep sleep is a time that your body is actually clearing stress out Uh, there are hormones that happen when you have stress and they get broken down and removed from the body when you are sleeping so if you are able to do it try to get at least eight hours of sleep a night. That can be hard sometimes, especially if you have to work a night shift. It can be hard if you have small children, but do the best that you can to sleep more. Whatever that is, try to get to eight hours. Even if you can get a little more than eight hours, that's excellent. Whatever amount of sleep that you're getting now, just see, can you rearrange some stuff in your life so that you could sleep half an hour more or an hour more. Maybe that means watching a little bit less television before you go to bed. And maybe that's a hard trade off to make because that's how you're relaxing from your stressful day. But experiment with it, experiment with different changes that you can make in your life that will allow you to to be in the bed a little bit longer to allow your body to sleep a little bit longer because that is the time that you're clearing out that stress from your body, kind of giving your body a chance to reset and start over. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. So stress was one of the big drivers for high blood pressure. The other one that we wanted to talk about today is salty processed foods. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so with this, there's a couple of different ways that, uh, that these things can lead to the heightened pressure in the body. So one is that uh, salty foods like this, they cause your body to retain water. And that means that your body overall has more stuff inside it, more fluid inside it. Um, instead of peeing out as much water as you normally would, instead now you're keeping a lot more of that water inside of the system. Mm-hmm. And so more water in the body puts more pressure, not just on your blood vessels, but on everything, you know? Yeah. Yeah. You know, sometimes you feel really bloated in the belly and your belly actually gets kind of, it sticks out a little bit from that bloating. Um, or sometimes your fingers maybe swell up, especially if it's hot outside or your ankles swell up a little bit. That's because you're holding on to water and that extra water is pushing against things in your body because it needs somewhere to be. It's trying to make some space for itself. Yeah. The other piece going on here is that these kind of salty processed foods, they also induce inflammation. They cause inflammation in the body. They're generally made with ingredients that can cause wounds or damage on the insides of the blood vessels. And then when that happens, you need to make a kind of a scab to heal it. Mm -hmm. And you make those with cholesterol. um, And we're going to talk more about that in a little moment. Uh, But that means, though, that you've got a spot in the in the blood vessel in the tube there that's more narrow. Right. Because the the scab kind of thing, it takes up some space. So that causes pressure, just like if you were to take a garden hose and kind of squeeze it a little bit, you know, that's going to cause an increase in the pressure right there at that spot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, so uh, first, some actions that you can take to reduce the damage that salty and processed foods are having in your body. And the first one is try not to eat those foods. That's hard because they are delicious. Mm. And sometimes they are also what's available. Um, So things like chips and cookies and pretzels or fast food like French fries and McDonald's or whatever. Or the uh, canned stew that I ate for many years in college. (laughs) Yes, exactly. Exactly. Uh Um, So these things are very available. They're often cheap um, and they're kind of delicious. Part of the reason that they're delicious is actually because they are putting chemicals in that trick your taste buds into thinking that they are delicious and um that that those chemicals actually are a little bit addictive and that's why you want more and more of these foods so it's hard to give them up but on the other hand they are causing damage in the body so 
if you can reduce the amount, it doesn't mean don't ever eat a potato chip again, but if you can reduce the amount of these foods that you eat, then that's going to help a lot. Uh, you can choose unsalted options, or if there's a low sodium option, you can choose that as well. Yeah, that would be a little improvement. It'll be a little bit better, yeah. For sure, yeah. The other big thing to do there is to add more vegetables to your diet mm -hmm. in, in whatever way you can. Um, any kind of veggie that you like, uh, fruits as well. Um, you want to get those into your life as much as possible. Yeah, it really doesn't matter. If the vegetable you like is broccoli, eat a bunch of broccoli. You don't have to suffer through a vegetable that's not delicious to you. Um, any yeah. vegetable is good. Yeah. It is good to get multiple colors, you know, mm -hmm. if you can get some orange and some green and some purple and some red <laughs> yeah. you know, into your into your vegetable uh, platter array there, then that is actually good for you because each of those color compounds is going to be delivering um, different anti-inflammatory uh, plant chemicals into your body. Mm -hmm. Good things that help your body to keep inflammation low. Um, some of them even do help to directly reduce the blood pressure. Yes. So yeah, anytime that we can choose vegetables, fruits, uh, that's a good thing. Yes. Yeah. Also, it's fine if you get frozen vegetables. That mm -hmm. is no problem. Frozen vegetables are great. Uh, you know, you hear a lot that you should have fresh vegetables because that's the best. Maybe it's the best, but frozen vegetables are fantastic. They're, they're easier to get, they're easier to prepare, they're less expensive, so you don't have to fuss and make sure that you have fresh vegetables. Uh, it is completely fine to get frozen or to get frozen berries, whatever. Yeah, it's just, it's a lot easier to not, not waste, you know, when mm -hmm. it comes to that, because you can just thaw or heat, you know, a serving or whatever you need for tonight. Yeah. Um, and then keep the rest frozen. So yeah, that is often a great way to go there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's talk about a couple of herbs that are, that are really helpful for um, this aspect. And the first one is going to be dandelion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this is dandelion leaf, which you can have as tea in a tea bag, or you can go out if you have dandelions that are growing around you and the ground that they're growing in is reasonably clean, you know, they didn't spray it with anything, then you can just pick the dandelions right there and eat them. You can make tea out of dandelions that you pick yourself, or you can eat them like salad and now it's a vegetable. Either one is going to be fine. Either option is going to be fine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. And when you're, when we're looking specifically at this effect for, um, for the, the diuretic impact that the dandelion has, we are looking at the leaf for that in particular. Mm -hmm. So you may find at the store that there's dandelion root tea bags and dandelion leaf tea bags. You want the leaf. So for this one, we want the leaf. The root is a great medicine. We're going to be talking about it probably in future episodes. Yes. <laughs> for sure. Um, but for this purpose, we're looking at the leaf and the leaf here works like a diuretic or what a lot of people will call a water pill. Mm -hmm. um, it helps your body to get rid of extra water, extra fluid that isn't really helping, that you don't, you don't need in the system. And that is, again, that, that water retention can cause the pressure to raise in your system. So with the, with the dandelion leaf, we eliminate excess water. That reduces the amount of stuff. It reduces the amount of pressure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The nice thing is that dandelion also is feeding you at the same time. It's delivering you a bunch of vitamins and minerals. And so you're getting good stuff that helps to fight inflammation, helps to normalize function inside of the body mm -hmm. while you're also getting rid of that excess water. Yes. So again, we're looking at drinking three to four cups a day of this tea. And in this case, it is good if you let it sit for a long time, let it brew for at least an hour, but even like four hours would be really great. If you're working with dandelion leaf tea bags, then put in two if you can afford it. Um, if you want to make a whole quart at a time, then put in at least four tea bags into that whole quart and let it sit for a little bit longer. The reason that we let this tea sit a little longer is because there's a lot of vitamins and minerals in the dandelion leaf and we want to make sure there's enough time to get all of it out. Mm. You'll see as you let that tea sit there and brew for a while, in the beginning it won't be very dark but as it goes on it's going to get dark brown and the darker that it gets that's the more stuff 
that is coming out of that tea into out of the out of the leaves the the leaves that are actually in the tea bags or if you have actual leaves you're getting more of it out of the leaves and into the water so that you can drink it and and have that for yourself yeah mm -hmm. yeah yeah um and you know when you when you eat the dandelion leaves then you get everything, yeah. <laughs> uh, because you your your digestion is going to get it's, it's going to access all of those vitamins and minerals mm -hmm. and, and other good nutrients in there for you. Yeah. In fact, if you make your tea out of fresh leaves or dried leaves, either one, you can even eat them after you've made tea out of them. Okay, they're a little soggy and like overboiled spinach, but if you're really trying to get the most out of it, then just swallow them right down because then there's nothing that you're leaving out, right? You're mm -hmm. getting everything that was in the water and anything that didn't come out into the water and is still into the, in the leaf itself. If you just eat that, uh, now you have that too. You didn't waste any part at all. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Okay. Um, now if you're already taking a, a diuretic medication or if you're taking a water pill already, then you're not going to want to add uh, dandelion leaf tea on top of that. Mm. That just because you already have that action happening and we don't want to put twice that amount into your body. Yeah. Yeah. It would still be fine to eat dandelion leaves in your salad though. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's always a good idea really. Yeah. Yeah. You um, know, Oh God. No, yeah, you're, you're up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the other plant that we're going to talk about here is parsley leaf. And parsley is also a diuretic. It also is going to help you get rid of that extra water. And it also has lots of minerals and vitamins. They have a lot of shared actions, parsley and dandelion. Mm -hmm. um, and parsley you can find at most grocery stores and it does, it's not usually very expensive. Uh, so even if you're looking and, and you have to be careful with your budget for fresh vegetables, usually you can get a whole bunch of parsley for 50 cents or a dollar. So um, that that is good and it'll last you for a couple of days. Mm -hmm. um, you can work with the leaves in that bunch and you can work with the stems too. Just chop every little bit of it right up to the end. That's totally fine. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. So, um, again, you know, that's going to have that diuretic effect, the vitamin and mineral content, get rid of the extra water, um, eat it in salad, eat it in anything that you cook. That's all good. <laughs> um, you can chop it up super small and mix it into something and hardly even know it's there. Like if you put it into spaghetti sauce or into chili or something like mm -hmm. that, you, you won't hardly even know it's there at all, but you will still be getting those benefits. Right. Some people don't really like the flavor of parsley. And if that's you, don't say, oh, well, then I'm not even going to try it. You will be so surprised if you chop it up really small. And I really do. I just take scissors and I just chop little bits of it off. Um, you you really don't taste it, especially if it's in something like chili. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, cilantro is quite similar. Cilantro is maybe more divisive in terms of flavor. Yes. Some <laughs> people love it and some people don't. Yeah. But it has very similar um similar qualities mm -hmm. and actions to yeah. parsley. So if that's, if that's one you like, then you can work with that in the same basic way. Yes. Um, you can make a tea with parsley if you want to as well. Um, and with that, it may have a bit more of its um, aromatic quality. So that's a, a quality where if you were to chop parsley and, and take a smell right there, there's a, a distinctive scent that's like not quite sharp, but moving in that direction. It's, you know, it, it, it smells has like a, parsley. It has a, it has a strong smell. Yeah. There's a, there's a stimulating feeling that goes along with it. And when you make parsley into, into tea, or even if you just eat fresh bunches of it, you get more of that sensation and more of those chemicals, uh, than you do when it's been cooked, mm -hmm. uh, as you cook, a lot of them will kind of evaporate off, um, taking it fresh that way or making a, making a tea with that, uh, parsley while it's still fresh like that that's going to actually give it a little bit of a disinfectant action for the urinary system. So mm -hmm. for people who are prone to UTI, um, then this could also be a helpful herb to introduce. Yes. So we'll have a whole future episode on UTI, um, but just as a little preview. Yes. Parsley is a good friend. <laughs> so if you are wanting to work with parsley, again, we're going to do this every day um, it, because we're trying to, to lower that pressure and keep it low. That means we have to do this every day. Um, and so we're going to look for like a quarter cup of chopped parsley a day would be great. 
Um, or if you're going to make it into tea like you did with the dandelion, then, you know, a, three or four cups of the tea and you could switch back and forth between dandelion and parsley depending on what's available to you or just flavor what you feel like in the day. Mm -hmm. Now, parsley is another herb that has effects on blood sugar levels and that's great and we're going to talk about it more when we talk about diabetes and pre-diabetes but if you are taking medication for diabetes this is another herb where it's important to test your glucose levels daily because parsley can improve your health if you have diabetes that it can improve the situation enough that you might need to change your your doctor might need to change your dose of your diabetes medication so if you're going to start working with parsley every day then it's a good and if you are taking diabetes medication then it's a good idea to just test and make sure if you see those numbers coming down that's very good news but if they keep coming down you do need to give your doctor a call let them know and make sure that you don't need an adjustment in your medication yeah mm -hmm. okay other things that can help moving more yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. or moving differently you know depending on what your what your life is like what your work is like mm -hmm. so it can be difficult to get rid of excess water um, especially down in the legs mm -hmm. but walking helps a lot walking physically helps to circulate to pump those fluids and get them moving again mm -hmm. when you walk your muscles can squeeze that water up from your legs up to your bladder so that you can pee it out <laughs> um, it's okay if you walk slowly. It's okay if you walk short distances. It's okay if you walk around your house, like inside the house, maybe outside the building, whatever. Uh, any kind of walking or gentle movement like that is going to be very helpful. Mm -hmm. But the idea here is to try to do it at least three times in the day. Um, and that helps to break up those long periods of, of sedentary sitting and everything. Um, my favorite way to do this, the way I, I advise people to, uh, if it's at all workable for you, is to get in the habit of taking a little walk after each meal. It's a great way to remember to do it because it just becomes like, okay, I eat and then I go for a little walk mm -hmm. and that's just my pattern, right? Um, but it also helps your digestion, you know, and it does help with blood sugar regulation. Yeah. And it helps with a lot of things, really. Mm -hmm. um, so having a, a brief, you know, again, five minutes away from home, five minutes back, 10 minute total walk three times a day, that would do a lot. Mm -hmm. That would do a lot. Now, if you are one of those people where you work on your feet all day and you are moving all day long and so you don't want to add more walking to that, then you could lay flat on the floor and put your feet up on the wall. Mm. And that actually gives a nice, very gentle stretch and it helps, you're allowing gravity to move that, that extra water down out of the legs. Um, so you can lay that way and listen to some music, uh, lay that way and let your kids tell you what, what they did today, um, lay that way and just be very quiet and, and not do anything for anyone, any of those things are fine, um, and lay down uh, with your feet on the wall for five minutes, ten minutes, what's comfortable for you, try to do it a few times a day, um, just to make sure that you're giving all that fluid a chance to come down. Mm -hmm. All right. Another big thing here, you've probably heard before, is that quitting smoking, uh, especially tobacco, is very helpful if you've got high blood pressure. Mm -hmm. It's difficult, right? But herbs can help. Yes. Tulsi, in particular, uh, can really help out a lot with that. Remember that that herb is also called holy basil. Uh, but Tulsi helps to reduce cravings, not just for tobacco or, or nicotine, but for sugar cravings and, and other kinds as mm -hmm. well. Um, it really does help us to get a handle on that. Uh, and it boosts your mood at the same time. Um, so Tulsi can really help a lot as you're going through the process of cutting down or quitting smoking. Mm -hmm. um, and again, it's fine in tea bags. If you're drinking three or four cups of Tulsi tea a day, that should really make a difference in your, uh, in your inner feeling, your ability to do this transition. Yeah. Um, and you can also take it as often as you need to support yourself as you go through that process. Yes. As we've mentioned before, if you are going to work with Tulsi in large or consistent doses, like the three or four cups a day or a quart of tea per day, then that can have an impact on your blood sugar levels. And if you are a medicated diabetic, or if you're taking medications to help manage diabetes, then you're going to need to check your blood sugar frequently as you work with Tulsi in those, those, you know, those 
normal doses. Yes. Those effective yeah. doses. Yeah. You're gonna need to check your blood sugar levels frequently in order to make sure that they're staying in the right place or moving in the right direction, but um, so that you're able to make adjustments with your doctor as things go along. Yes. Yeah. All right. Whew. Okay. So those are some strategies to reduce high blood pressure. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, another very common problem with cardiovascular health is high cholesterol levels. So we want to give you some tools to work with that as well. First of all, let's talk a little bit about what cholesterol is. Cholesterol is made in your body and it does a lot of things for you actually. It's not actually bad. It helps you to heal wounds, it helps your brain to function, and it's how you make a lot of your hormones. But when you have too much cholesterol, then that usually means that there are some problems in your body. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the cholesterol itself is a result of those problems. Right. Yeah. You were talking earlier about how cholesterol can form a scab to help heal wounds in the arteries themselves. So in this case, the cholesterol isn't bad. The damage in the, in the blood vessel is what's bad. The cholesterol is just trying to help you heal it. But it still, it gets in the way, especially if you need a lot of it, especially if you have a lot of that kind of damage, mm -hmm. then building up those scabs, building up those cholesterol uh, patches that are trying to help heal, that's gonna cause more pressure uh, in the blood vessels. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, the most common cause of that kind of internal damage is uh, from eating foods that that themselves are damaging. Um, so that's going to lead right into some of our first actions to take to try to try to bring cholesterol levels into a, a more balanced place. Mm -hmm. Right. So the first thing to do then is to reduce processed food from your diet as much as you can. Mm -hmm. So that includes things like chips and cookies and and pretzels. Um, it also includes fast food and honestly, most restaurant food. Um, most restaurants are in the business of selling flavor and enjoyment, and that's important and we thank them for it. <laughs> um, but it's not exactly the same thing as optimal nutrition. <laughs> right. It is not what grandma used to make. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, the biggest issue uh, with um, res restaurant food and also honestly with, with processed and packaged food has to do with the, the oils that they use to cook with. Um, particularly when we're talking about cholesterol, these oils, and we're thinking there about soy oil, corn oil, canola, cottonseed, and sort of generic vegetable oil, those cause inflammation and they cause damage inside the body and especially in the blood vessels. Mm -hmm. They're the biggest driver of your cholesterol going up. So if we can reduce the amount of them that we eat, then that can make a big difference. And starting at home is great. You know, if you can use olive oil or coconut oil or palm oil when you cook at home instead, that's fantastic and a really great thing to do. But you have to recognize that your processed food, like stuff that comes in a package or the food you get at restaurants, that's usually prepared or cooked or, or contains those problematic oils in it. And that's usually where most of us are getting them from. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's a great idea if you're able to cook your own food and to focus on those healthier oils, olive oil, coconut oil, palm oil, even butter would be better. Um, so though that's one change you can make at home. And again, if possible, add more vegetables to your diet. Uh, vegetables, berries, these are in themselves, not just are they, are they like healthier in terms of food, but they are also, um, providing your body with tools that will reduce inflammation, will heal that damage. And again, it is fine to get frozen vegetables or frozen berries. They're often more uh, affordable and you're not gonna waste as much. It's totally fine. Yeah. One other food thing that can make a huge difference here would be to introduce into the diet some small, usually very cheap uh, fatty fishes. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking there of sardines, uh, herring, uh, anchovies, things like that, you know, like little fish that come in a can. Um, <laughs> but they have really good fat profile in them. They have the omega-3 fats, those anti-inflammatory fats that we really want. Mm. And the omega-3 are beneficial. You may have heard of omega-3 already, right? One of the reasons they're so beneficial for us is that they kind of balance out the inflammatory fats or the bad fats that we were just talking about. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you can 
eat, you know, I can, or eat a serving of uh, sardines or anchovies or herring fish. Um, if you can do that a few times a week, that will go a really long way toward providing your body with healthy fats. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, that's a really great way. Yes. Plus, you get food out of it. Right. There's you protein, know? there's yeah. calcium, there's a whole bunch of mineral content in there. It's, it's good all around. Yes. All right. There are herbs who can help too, because the reality is, of course, you cannot avoid these foods all of the time, these foods that cause some damage. And so there are herbs who can help your body to heal that damage more effectively. And the first one we want to talk about is garlic. Um, if you work with garlic, then garlic is going to help repair a lot of that damage so that you don't need to make as much cholesterol. So that means your cholesterol level will be lower simply because you don't have to produce so much. Garlic is easy to work with. You can just add it to your dinner or you can also make garlic pickles and then just eat one or two of them a day. Garlic uh, pickles are super easy to make. Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. So all you're gonna do is get a bunch of garlic, peel every clove of garlic. You can cut them in half if you want to, but you don't have to, and put them in a jar. And then you're gonna fill that jar with apple cider vinegar. And if you like, if you like sweeter pickles, you can put a little bit of honey in there too. And you're just gonna let them sit for at least two weeks. Now, during this process, there will probably be a day where they turn a little bit blue and you look at them and you say, oh my goodness, why are they turning blue? That's normal. That's just a chemical reaction that's happening and it's totally fine. Um, it'll only happen for a day or two and then it'll go away but it's not mold or anything like that. Um, eventually they may turn a little bit brown because they're taking, they're absorbing in the vinegar and the vinegar has a brown color. So it's going to give the garlic pickles a little bit of that brown color too. That's also fine. Uh, but once you have let them sit for about two weeks, you can shake them every now and then. You could put mustard seed in there if you like, or a little dill if you like, whatever you like for your pickle re recipes. Uh, and then you can just take one clove a day and eat it up like a pickle um, or two if you really like them. Yeah. Yeah. And I think you mentioned, but we use uh, apple cider vinegar mm -hmm. for this yeah. in instead of like white vinegar. I mean, you could do it with balsamic if you want to, um, if you've got that. <laughs> but... Honestly, you could do it with white vinegar too if you have to, but apple cider vinegar has other health benefits. Yeah. So since we need to get some vinegar, why not get the one that has some health benefits so that your the true. whole thing is better for you? Yeah. Yeah. That's the way, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Um, so, now, look, you can also eat garlic in other ways. You know, you, yes. you can make these make these pickles and that's a super handy, convenient way. It really reduces the, the bite or the, the heat of the garlic and makes it a lot more more tolerable, especially if your stomach's a little touchy. Right. Um, but if you like it, then you can just uh, crush some garlic and put that onto your food. Yeah. You can, you can eat cooked garlic. When it comes to these benefits for cardiovascular health, um, really any way that you get garlic into you is going to help out. Um, you don't have to be, be super picky about optimizing it or, or anything like that. It doesn't Just, have to be raw. It's yeah. okay if it, yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, garlic powder, it does still help. Not quite as much though. Mm -hmm. um, really the best benefits here are coming from like Bring home the actual garlic bulbs, chop them up, prepare them. Maybe you make pickles. Maybe you just put them into dinner. However you take them, um, that's the best the best way to go. Yes. Yeah. Now, if you are taking blood thinners, garlic might cause you to bleed more easily. So um, if, if you're taking blood thinners, you can ask your doctor if it's okay for you to eat garlic, or you can just um, be aware and watch. And if you do notice that you bleed more easily, then you can ask about it. Most people say that it's still safe to eat some garlic in your dinner. But if you have a question about it, definitely just check in with your doctor. They're going to know because they know what garlic is. Um, so they won't think you're weird or anything like that. Um, but just if you are taking blood thinners, you can ask about it to be sure about what's right for you and your body. Um, but otherwise, eat it up. Eat as much garlic as you like. If you're trying to get the effect on your cholesterol level, then at least have one or two cloves of garlic every day. Mm, yeah. 
Okay, um, so parsley, we had mentioned when we're talking about blood pressure, but it can also help with cholesterol issues. Mm -hmm. um, and there it's helping to repair some of the damage that's done in those blood vessel walls so that you don't need to make the cholesterol to cover over those damaged areas. Mm -hmm. um, so that means that eating parsley can reduce your cholesterol levels. And then again, it has those vitamins and those minerals and those aromatic plant constituents that are helping us in other ways. So lots of benefits coming in through here. You can eat your parsley in salad. You can put it into any food that you that you cook. Uh, as we said earlier, if you don't love the flavor, then just chop it up, mix it into chili or spaghetti sauce or something like that, and uh, you'll hardly even know it's there. Um, if you do like it, then you can just you can just eat a whole bunch of it. Yeah, you know? go like, crazy. Just bite right in. That's totally fine. Yeah. You can make tea. You know. But the target we're looking for for like medicinal effects is to be consuming like a quarter cup or so of chopped parsley each day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then just remember that if you are diabetic and you're taking medication for diabetes, remember that parsley can have a really strong benefit for diabetes. And what that means is that you need to test your blood sugar level levels every day. If you see your blood sugar levels coming down, that's actually great news. But we need to make sure that your doctor knows about that so that if you need to make adjustments to your medication so that that can happen. Um, if you're not taking any kind of medication for diabetes, then this is just a wonderful benefit for you. And we'll definitely talk more about this when we talk about diabetes and prediabetes. Yeah, you betcha. <laughs> All right. One more herb we wanted to highlight here is hibiscus. Yes. And hibiscus is a is a herb that's actually very helpful for lowering cholesterol. It has a number of different effects that contribute to that. For one thing, it has a lot of vitamins. Mm -hmm. It has a lot of antioxidants. Um, in fact, some of its most powerful antioxidants are also the pigments that give hibiscus the the red color yeah. um, to the flower and the the part of the flower that we work with. Um, so those antioxidants, you may have heard that before, those are compounds that reduce inflammation inside of the body. And they also help to heal damage uh, where that has taken place. Mm -hmm. um, so hibiscus helps to heal the damage. That means that you don't need to recruit more cholesterol and make those scabs or those patches. Um, and so your cholesterol level goes down. Pretty fantastic. <laughs> You can drink hibiscus as tea. It'll make a very red tea. And you know, some people call hibiscus roselle or sorrel. Um, now there's another plant called sorrel that is like a small green plant. Uh, and that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about the red flowers, the, the flower calyx. Um, but in a lot of places they call it sorrel or some places they call it Jamaica flower or even just Jamaica. Uh, so whatever you call it, this bright red tea uh, is actually really delicious. It's got a sour flavor. Um, so if you want to sweeten it, it's best to sweeten with honey instead of sugar because sugar is going to cause more damage in the body and we would like to avoid that. So instead, let's sweeten with honey if you can or don't sweeten it at all. If you can get used to that sour flavor, that's even better. Mm -hmm. A lot of people also like to make hibiscus into jam um, or they just eat the, the calyx. It's not actually the flower petals that we work with. It is the fruit. It's called a calyx and it sort of looks like a closed up flower, but it's actually the fruit that comes after the flower petals have fallen off and it's bright red and you can get that dried sometimes and it's fun to just eat that too like kind of like a dried fruit, like sort of leathery. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, if you do make the hibiscus tea, um, you can also put in some sour, uh, some other sour things, like a bit of lemon or lime mm -hmm. is good in there and complements that flavor well. Yeah. Um, so yeah, but a, a very helpful herb. And again, one that a lot of folks are already working with and may not have realized that it's it's helping there on a medicinal level too. Yes, um, yes. Now for medicinal effects, we are looking for more than a cup a day, you know? Um, our usual range here is like three or four cups or mugs, you know, of tea in a given day. Um, and again, it can be hot, it can be iced, either way is totally fine. Yeah. yeah. And you can drink as much of it as you like. If you really love red tea, go crazy. Um, and you can make a big batch of it in the morning or the night before, whatever's convenient, and then keep it in the refrigerator or put it in your water bottle and take it with you. 
uh, that is also totally fine. Whatever will make it easiest for you to drink a lot of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So garlic, parsley, hibiscus, helping out with that cholesterol issue. Yes. Cool. So then um, other things that help out, guess what? Movement. <laughs> <laughs> You're sensing a theme here, I believe. Yes. Uh, but moving your body more improves your circulation. And the better that blood flows throughout the body, the easier it is to repair some damage quickly before it can become a serious problem. Mm -hmm. Moving more also makes your heart stronger, and it also makes your blood vessels stronger, right? Because they, they become more resilient, more able to flex, more able to change shape and operate at a, a bunch of different levels of tension in a healthy way without, without suffering damage from that. Not, without getting sort of stuck in that place of hypertension, of too much tension. Yeah, they have that resilience, that flexibility. Mm -hmm. um, and again, that helps to prevent high cholesterol from turning into a, a bigger, more serious problem. Mm -hmm. So same kind of idea. We're looking to get five or 15 minutes or somewhere in between uh, a few times a day, at least, right? To take a walk or to dance around or to do some stretching or to chase your kids around the house <laughs> like, a, like an animal, I don't know. Any, anything like that, some kind of movement you can do to get that blood flowing, get things moving around, uh, get you breathing a little, that's gonna be good. You know, when I was growing up, we always had spray bottles filled with water. Uh, my mom didn't like Windex or anything like that. She liked to just have a spray bottle with plain water around to wipe things up with or to dust. And one day it was really hot and she sprayed us and that just sort of became a thing. And then every so often we would chase each other around the house with spray bottles and it was really fun and funny. And so if you are home with the kids or whatever, and you need a little help remembering to run around the house a few times every day, then just get a spray bottle filled with water and start it as a family joke <laughs> and just, you know, somebody sprays somebody and now we're all running around the house <laughs> and uh, it can, it can be fun. You know, you're the time that you spend moving in a day doesn't have to be boring or miserable or, you know, doing the same thing over and over again, like just picking up the same weight or whatever. It doesn't have to be on a stair machine. It can be fun things that make everybody laugh. And um, I think that a spray bottle full of water could be a helpful tool here. <laughs> yeah, why not? Why not? All right. So um, after you've done a bunch more movement in your day or a different movement in your day, then you may want to sleep some more. And mm -hmm. that would be another benefit there too, right? Yes. So like we said, sleep is the time when your body's doing its best repair work and its recovery work and it's uh, you know solving all of those problems in internally. So if you've got high cholesterol, remember that's a sign that there's damage in the body that needs mm -hmm. to be repaired. And sleep is the key time for that to actually happen. Right. Um, so if you can get eight hours of sleep a night, fantastic. If you can get even more, better. You know, yeah. Take those opportunities when they come around. Um, and give your body that time to repair as much damage as possible. Yeah, that, you know, always remembering that cholesterol itself is not bad. But when you have high cholesterol, that is your body saying, there's a lot of damage in here, and I'm having to make a lot of cholesterol to fix this damage. And um, we don't, what we, we don't care how much cholesterol we have exactly. What we care about is how much damage do we have. And so we're taking that cholesterol number as a signal from the body saying, I have a lot of damage that needs to be repaired. And we do our best repair work when we're sleeping. So even though it's hard to squeeze more time to sleep into a day, it really will make a big difference in your body's ability to heal that damage. For sure. All right. Well, so there are some simple things that you can do to work on cardiovascular health issues, to work on the high blood pressure, to work on elevated cholesterol levels. Um, mm. And so we'll be continuing this series uh, next week and for a little while, you know, as we go <laughs> yes. along. Yes. Next week, we're going to talk about type 2 diabetes and also about pre-diabetes. In fact, we're even going to talk about suspected diabetes. So if you have people in your family who have it and you're thinking, I don't want to get that, we're going to give strategies 
for self-care that will help you improve your situation uh, regardless of where you fall in, in, that, in those categories. So that's coming next week. And until then, um, take care of each other. Look out for one another. Try to find some ways every day that you can do something nice for your body. And drink some tea. Drink some tea. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Talk to you next time. Bye-bye.